This is the full blueprint to losing weight forever. And I'm going to walk you through the four areas you absolutely must build to lose weight permanently. The first floor is outcomes. And we're going to start with how to not lose weight the wrong way. In these after photos of mine at the same goal weight, I look fluffier on the left because a third was fat loss while the rest was lean mass loss. While in the right photo, I got to my goal by almost entirely losing fat. We all want the right photo, and yet the majority of the diets and workouts out there cause the left photo. Here's my co-coach Lucy, who also fell into the same trap. And it's not just us. A huge number of people losing weight fall prey to most of their weight loss not being fat loss. And then because muscle is way harder to put on, it takes double the time to fix this mistake than it did to lose the weight in the first place. But worry not, this blueprint will make sure you end up as the fit lean after photo, starting with the second room on the outcomes floor tracking correctly. You must have noticed that if you weigh yourself daily, your weight fluctuates a lot, even by as much as five pounds. If you're like me, this feels like an emotional roller coaster where I'm thrilled by one pound drop one day and then the next day, inexplicably, it's up by three pounds. So all the watching my food and exercise I did yesterday didn't count or did it count, but not enough. Should I be watching my eating even more, exercising even more? The mystery is solved when we break down weight into fat versus lean mass. The fat you have stored doesn't fluctuate much day to day, and neither does muscle and bone mass. But the other part of lean mass, water, glycogen, poop weight, etc., fluctuates a lot day to day. This is why you can see an awesome two pound drop after a good bowel movement, or why after having dinner out last night, you see a sudden increase in weight. It may not be fat gain. But how can you tell? Three things. One, after this video, use the calculator linked in the description below to calculate your fat versus lean mass. Two, stop focusing on your weight number and start focusing on comparing your fat versus lean mass change. If you're losing more fat than lean mass, then you're making progress. And last, expand the window over which you evaluate fat loss to one week. You can do this by either checking in once a week or measuring daily by taking a seven day average to smooth out the fluctuations. But what if you're losing more lean mass than fat? If this was happening because I stopped doing the right things, I would feel guilty and frustrated with myself. Or if this was happening despite me doing everything right, then I'd get discouraged. In either case, I knew the right thing was to keep trying. And yet I'd lose motivation and quit until the next time I weigh and shock myself into trying again. It was like I couldn't help myself. I read books on willpower and discipline. Turns out I was barking up the wrong tree. And what comes to, to your mind when you see this little illustration? Head and heart. Head is associated with our goals and values, and heart is associated with what we really like. We also find that the overlap section is associated with harmony and well-being. But what if the two circles are don't align? Research has shown that discrepancies between head and heart lead to stress and burnout, and they may make it harder to reach our goals. In fact, even if you reach your goal that are not supported by your heart, this may not lead to happiness. This is why after five years, people tend to have regained 80% of their weight back. They lost weight by over-exercising their willpower instead of aligning their actions with their head and heart. But how do we align our head and heart? Develop your personal vision. If you're like me, you think you already have this. You want to look and feel great. But the litmus test isn't what we think, but what we do. After trying many different methods to create my personal vision, like the Golden Circle by Simon Sinek, Mind Valley's Life Book, Acceptance and Commitment Therapies, Values Exercises, and many more, the best approach I found is to harness our brain's natural tendency towards paranoia. We are way better at finding problems than inventing solutions. The simple but powerful way is inversion. It has five steps. Step one, note down the four areas of life, health, social, leisure, and work. Step two, write down for each area what would be your worst nightmare. For example, for leisure, I love traveling, and so not being able to explore a city like Lisbon, whose amazing spots are mostly accessible by foot, would leave me feeling frustrated, which then bleeds into my relationships, where being unable to share those experiences with friends and family who are able to explore and travel, would leave me feeling like I'm standing out of frame, watching others live life. Step three, add how continuing to be overweight worsens your nightmares. After all, our bodies are the vehicles through which we live life. Step four, take your worst nightmares and invert them. For example, inverting my leisure nightmare means I have the body to backpack, travel, and explore the world fully. And step five, reread your answers every week to refuel your why. Edit your answers when you have more details to add or remove scenarios that don't resonate anymore. Who you want to be and the life you want to live is a process of constant discovery. 
So expect to be working on this little by little every week. But we're still missing a very important piece. There is a third component to our motivation. Imagine the following scene. A guy is playing tennis. He seems highly motivated, so head and heart is not an issue here, but he misses the ball. What is this tennis player lacking? Skills and abilities. So we need to add a third circle to the model. I call it hand. Csikszent Mihai, a Hungarian researcher, called this experience flow. And he suggested that flow is the secret to happiness. How to achieve flow while losing fat is what the rest of this video covers. Starting with floor two of the blueprint, actions you must take to achieve the body and life outcomes you just set. The actions seem plastered everywhere. Eat smaller portions, cut sugar, maybe cut carbs, exercise every day, sleep more. They sound simple, and yet if you're like me, impossible to stick to for six months, let alone the rest of my life. I'd go from drinking three cans of soda a day to once a day, from exercising zero times a week to three times a week, from cooking one meal a day to two. But I kept failing a lot due to weekend brunches or crazy work weeks. I'd wonder why can't I stick to anything? The problem was I was approaching weight loss like going from couch to a 10K run in one day. Just like weight loss, a 10K seems simple. I put one foot after another and keep going. But no doubt at the end of it, my body and mind will be wrecked. And I won't be walking at my normal speed, let alone running a 10K soon after. This is a typical 10K training plan, and there are three principles we can learn from it for weight loss. One, it builds over a course of months towards a 10 kilometer or six mile run. Principle being to start small, smaller than you think you can do, and add to it in small increments over time. For fat loss, these are stages that map to your body fat percentage. The habits are small when you're in the overfat range, then expand or pick up more habits as you get leaner. I will be covering what they are in the next two rooms. Two, it doesn't consist of only running flat. You cross train, you run hills, you run intervals. Principle being you're training yourself for all kinds of terrain, which for weight loss means training to stick to your habits across all kinds of weeks, stressful work weeks, holidays, I'm sore and don't want to exercise weeks, and so on. Without following principle one, this principle is impossible to nail. More details on how to do this coming in the next two rooms. And third, there are rest days. And there are days where despite doing a longer run the previous week, you go back to a shorter run. For weight loss, this means realizing proactively when you need a mental break from weight loss or if you're about to face a week where sticking to your full plan is impossible. Then before the week even starts, you scale back to an even smaller but doable plan. How do you do this is covered in room three. But first, we start with the second room on the actions floor, nutrition. All the diets out there seem like separate, unrelated approaches where one of them must be the truest of them all. Paleo was all the rage when I was losing weight, so I decided to try that. I lost weight, but a month later, the holidays were upon me and saying no to gingerbread, turkey, and cake felt like punishment because I wanted to eat with my family. Is that a crime? I could have jumped back onto paleo after the holidays, but I kept thinking what would be different next time I'm on holidays? I couldn't come up with an answer that honestly reassured me the same wouldn't happen again. And so started the chase of the one weight loss plan truest of them all. I looked into keto next and just like paleo, since it slashed carbs by a lot, it would majorly impact all holiday, vacation, and social eating. I felt I would repeat the same cycle of weight loss but fall off afterward. Then I looked into intermittent fasting, which didn't ask to cut anything but meals, so I thought, that's easy. I used to eat only a banana for breakfast, so I skipped that but then lost no weight. Some Googling told me it must be my biggest meal that I cut for intermittent fasting to work, which for me was dinner. But that would again cause my paleo slash keto problem, so I skipped lunch instead. Weight loss begins again. But then after three weeks of skipping lunch, I felt lethargic and less productive, which made me stressed about the work piling up because I was slower now. This meant I'd end up eating pizza and sleeping late as I try to cram in fun time before work stress starts again tomorrow. At this point, I started looking at macros, but then remembered tracking one number, calories, was tedious and difficult to stick to, let alone trying to track three numbers and thread the needle through all three. All right, final score. All caused weight loss when I stuck to them, but none I could stick to for a whole year. Feeling confused and helpless and being a science nerd, I turned to textbooks to understand what to do. The science made me realize there isn't one weight loss plan truest of them all, but rather each diet can be thought of like a building. Their shapes look totally different, but the science behind them is identical, which is why they all work when we can stick to them. Let's start with the science. Here's Dr. Peter Attia explaining the three main diet types to lose weight. 
You can directly restrict the number of calories you're eating. You can start to restrict macronutrients. That's what most diets are doing. I'm not eating sugar, I'm not eating carbs, I'm not eating fat. And then you have time restriction, what people call intermittent fasting. So all diets work because of one reason, you're consuming fewer calories. But what about a diet like keto, which doesn't restrict calories, and in fact tells you to eat more fat, which is nine calories per gram, while telling you to reduce carbs, which is four calories per gram. This should in net cause you to eat more calories, right? Here's daughter Peter Atia again, explaining why that doesn't happen. Are all calories created equal from an energy balance standpoint? Sure. If I give you a thousand calories of Coca-Cola versus a thousand calories of steak, it will have the same impact on your energy balance, but it won't have the same impact on your appetite and your ability to subsequently eat. Meaning after the 1000 calories of Coca-Cola or 1000 calories of fries, you're going to be hungry again way sooner than after 1000 calories of steak. This difference adds up over the day where the fries day is likely to be an over calories day while steak day is an under calories day. But since keto slashes carbs like fries, junk, sweets, bread, and nearly all processed foods, which are low satiety and thus we tend to overeat, while stacking our kitchens with only foods we tend to eat just enough of because we get full on them more easily, you end up indirectly having more under calorie days on keto, even if you're eating more fat because you eat more infrequently and just enough. This is how all low carb diets and even how the Weight Watchers point system works. But what about the effects of hormones on weight loss? Hormones alongside stress, digestion, sleep, etc., affect the calories out part of the equation. It's not just exercise that affects calories out, and I'll cover the other factors in floor three. But for now, know that hormonal conditions like menopause, PCOS, etc., can lower how many calories you burn, which is why the same calories in amount that causes weight loss for a person without a hormonal condition may not work for you. So ultimately, it still boils down to figuring out your personal calorie balance, aka maintenance calories, and creating a slight deficit from that. Now that I understood the science, I realized I could design my own building, one in which I could live in and stick to forever. Step one, after this video, use the calories calculator linked in the description below to know your maintenance calorie and start with 11 to 15% deficit. You want to average this over a week, each individual day doesn't matter. Having coached over 700 people, I have found this deficit to be sufficient for fat loss with near zero lean mass loss and sustainable to the degree of principles one and two. In the fourth area, the stairwell, I will cover how to tune this target weekly to be closer to your body's actual calorie balance. If you're someone who gets hungry earlier than four hours after your last meal, add on a greater than protein target of 17% of your calorie target and split the total protein you need to eat across all of your meals. Step two, after this video, use the body fat calculator linked in the description below to know your body fat percentage and therefore your body fat stage. At each stage, there's 20% of effort that will yield 80% of results. This is a universal principle called the Pareto principle, which has been found to apply to everything from agriculture to waste management. After this 20% point, diminishing returns strike where every extra unit of effort yields less and less additional results. But for weight loss, I'd argue it's negative returns because of how unsustainable the plan becomes, failing principle to it entirely, which means regaining your lost weight and perpetually yo-yoing. If you're in the unhealthy stage, your 20% effort must be focused on trimming down junk and sweets, but just enough to meet your calorie target. Look at where in your day or week you consume the most junk and sweets and only focus on reducing that episode by 15%. Rest of the time you can eat as you do now. By the time you get to the acceptable range, you will have built a habit of reduced junk and sweets eating and thus freed up brain space to work on creating the habit of having one to two whole food, high nutrition meals per day on average. Then in the good range, it extends to two to three whole food, high nutrition meals per day on average. Now, what about exercise? I think exercise is the single most important longevity drug we have, bar none. Most weight loss plans told me exercising three times a week was minimum. I started with group fitness classes at my gym, which went great the first few days. But I noticed I was also hungrier than normal throughout the week. I will powered my way into ignoring my hunger during the weekdays, but things always went sideways during the weekend. I thought to myself, well, I'll just exercise extra this coming week. But then when I exercised extra, I was also extra hungry, which created a vicious reward punishment cycle between exercise and food. 
It also didn't help that deep down, I knew I wouldn't be doing these workouts if it weren't for weight loss. The problem is how exercise is defined for us. Listen. You'd have to put an hour of that into steady state aerobic training, zone two. You'd have to put an hour into strength training. You'd probably want to put 20 minutes or 30 minutes into high intensity aerobic training. And then the remainder of that time into some of the stability training. If you're like me, you hear this and think, let me break out my heart rate monitor, notebook, and pen and design this precise, super optimized exercise plan. What's missing from this lab-generated exercise plan? Fun. The most important ingredient for sticking to exercise consistently for the rest of your life. And the surprising thing is the clinical explanation does not exclude fun. Steady state aerobic training zone two. This could just be walking with some hills or stairs and route. Biking, kayaking, dancing, and any sport that has you moving constantly fits into this. High intensity aerobic training. While you could bang out a hit session, it may be more fun to play tennis, pickleball, row, kickbox, or any sport that causes bursts of activity with periods of low intensity. While this may not be lab perfect, I'd look forward to these regardless of weight loss benefits. And ultimately, consistency beats lab perfect but infrequent sessions every single time. Stability. These don't need to be physical therapy type exercises. Yoga and Tai Chi are more fun examples. Strength training. Studies have shown that for general health and fitness, two full body 30 to 50 minute workouts give 84% of total benefits. Also, some, not all, of these sessions can be sports like bouldering, climbing, wrestling. Don't think exercise, think play. Go back to your life goal outcome and start on the activities you listed there. But doing all of this at once is a lot. It violates principles one and two. So if you're someone who is doing little to no play right now and don't have any movement you enjoy for itself, this is the minimum dose for fat loss. In the unhealthy range, all you need is 6,000 minimum steps a day on average. This won't get you hungry and perpetuate the reward punishment cycle and yet is sufficient to aid your fat loss. In the acceptable range, aim for 10,000 steps a day and one to two sessions of a sport or movement you enjoy and aligns with your life goal outcome. Notice the slow progression where you're in lockstep leveling up your eating habits with your movement habits. This counters slipping into the reward punishment cycle. In the good range, add one to two full body strength training sessions a week and one to two sessions of stability training, which could be yoga, tai chi, or if you like, physical therapy style exercises. But what about holidays and high stress weeks where even these simple actions become difficult? I'd start off meeting my calorie target perfectly and doing my workouts, but then inevitably a work deadline would drop that had me working late and my late night cravings on high. I'd also skip tracking a day and the next day felt it was too much to catch up. So I would fall off the wagon. Or on holidays, I try to track everything I'm eating, but honestly, I don't know what's accurate tracking for all these new foods. Not to mention, sticking to my target is hard when faced with tempting new foods to try that I don't get at home. This is where principle three swoops in to save the day. You have an on-ramp plan, but what you also need is a low ramp and an off-ramp plan. On days where you feel drawn to skip things but can see yourself do a quick thing, select the low ramp plan. For eating, this is hitting your maintenance target and forgetting about protein or whole food meals for that day. For workouts, in the unhealthy range, it's walking in your home even if it's just two minutes. In acceptable range, slash it down to 6,000 steps. In the good range, do the 6,000 steps and just one set of exercises so you're done in 15 minutes. And on days you aren't confident you can do even a quick thing, select the off-ramp plan. For food, skip tracking and pick a speed bump that slows your eating down. Pick one for before eating, like drinking one glass of water first before having each meal, and pick one for during eating, like using a small bowl and sitting at least three feet away from the big containers of food so you have to get up to get more servings, allowing you time to connect with your satiety. Workouts, you can skip them altogether. Anything you do here is bonus on an off-ramp day. Now we're onto the third floor, reactions, without which you will not succeed no matter how perfect your outcomes and actions. The first category is your body reactions, hunger being a big one. When I was losing weight, I was under the impression that being hungry was bad. And if I got hungry, I would eat just enough to stave off the hunger for a few more hours. I also noticed that when I started most diets, I didn't get hungry much. It was only after weeks that suddenly I'd be ravenous. Instead of fighting hunger, I should have been working with my body because hunger is an important indication that my body is about to start getting rid of muscle instead of fat. If I was getting hungry about three and a half hours after my previous meal, then that is normal and desired. If I'm getting hungry earlier than that, then I didn't eat a nutritious enough meal and I need to fix that by adding 10 to 20 grams of protein to that meal. 
And if I'm not hungry, even after four hours, I probably overeat and I should ideally only eat again if I feel discomfort in my abdomen, which I can point to. I should also reduce the frequency of such big meals. I also didn't know that hunger is cumulative. It's like building debt which all of us collect while losing weight. But just like you don't want to pick a mortgage interest, you can't pay off every month and end up in foreclosure. You also don't want to accrue calorie debt so quickly that your body freaks out and slams the brakes on your calories out, aka your metabolism. The 11 to 15% deficit we talked about prevents this, but it was based off a calculator. Your actual maintenance calories may be higher, which we have found to be the case for 10 to 15% of our clients. In this case, you'll find that despite having nutritious, high protein meals, you'll still be hungry sooner than three and a half hours after a meal. If so, you want to ignore what the calculator says and instead adjust incrementally. I'll cover how in the staircase part of the blueprint. The second big factor is energy or stress. Just like my energy fell off a cliff during intermittent fasting, big drops in energy from your normal is possibly a symptom of eating not enough or exercising too much. Possibly, because low energy can occur due to factors like higher stress days and have nothing to do with your new fat loss habits. How do you tell the two apart? Your body will reveal if it's likely not to your fat loss plan by gaining fat while dropping lean mass for two weekly check-ins straight. This is such a bizarre trend that first you want to check the batteries in your scale and tape measure and make sure the tape has not lost its elasticity. If all that looks good, then your body's in a catabolic state and you need to back off on everything. Crank up your calories to maintenance, reduce exercise to just walking at a low intensity pace, prioritize at least eight hours of sleep every night and take action to reduce stress. If your body is not in a catabolic state, then up your calories by 7% for next week and see if that helps. If not, up your protein by 7% for the week after. Throughout these weeks, focus on getting at least eight hours of high quality sleep. Another factor is period, and even men seem to go through a monthly pattern where the same actions cause stalled or slow fat loss for a week. I have no idea what is the cause, but the pattern is present all across the data. The thing to do is track fat loss alongside where in the month you are and observe when it causes wonky results. So on those weeks, you know not to take the numbers as seriously and wait for results over two weeks before drawing any conclusions. Speaking of wonky results, you must have noticed big weight gain after eating out or having soup the day before. Or sometimes you eat out and next day there's a big weight loss. It seems random and it made me question if I knew what I was doing. If you're tracking correctly, you'll see that the big weight loss or weight gain is mainly lean mass fluctuation. Your fat mass will correspond to your meeting or not your calorie target for the week. But it's possible you may see a change in fat mass that's opposite of what you'd expect given your calorie average for the week. If you do, and if you had a big carb or sodium or calorie day the day before, consider these wonky results and persist till next week before drawing conclusions. Going deeper into effects of eating, digestive issues are a cause for lowered calories out because it causes chronic inflammation. This in turn not only causes bloating and even skin conditions, but also ups the chances of storing fat. Digestive health is out of my area of expertise, so I can only advise to keep a food journal with digestion and skin symptoms annotated alongside. Identify your most likely inflammatory foods and experiment with replacing it with other foods, ideally ones you already know don't cause problems. And lastly, sleep has a massive impact on your calories out. Here's a graph of my co-coach Lucy where two weeks of bad sleep required a whole week of recovery before she could start losing fat again. This is because if you sleep poorly, your hunger and cravings double. The portions you eat also double and after 14 days of poor sleep, I would be 30% more likely to store them as fat. Combine all of this and you've made fat loss 500% harder on yourself just by not sleeping well. I've tried at least 33 different sleep hacks in the past. I used to go straight from work to TV or phone to trying to meditate myself to sleep. This never worked because that's like treating my brain like an on off switch when it's actually a dimmer. What I found to work best is to empty my mind from work, then fill my attention towards my body by doing an activity I enjoy like dancing or walking with friends, and then drain my physical energy by stacking the minimal set of mindful practices I enjoy leading all the way to bedtime. With that, we move on to the most ignored but make or break category of reactions, our mind. It is the source of willpower, motivation, and belief. And without it being on our side, no perfect outcomes, actions, and body reactions will win. Cravings are a great example of how I can be tracking correctly, doing actions that feel stupid lazy, have all my body reactions in check, and yet an insatiable desire for ice cream after dinner can wreck the whole day. Or I'm at a restaurant and I must order wine to feel like I'm truly relaxed. If I meet friends, it must be over food because that's how I feel connections are made. 
As author James Clear says in his New York Times bestselling book, Atomic Habits, cravings happen because we associate feelings we want to achieve, relaxation, relief from stress, celebrating a good day, connecting with people, with specific foods. It feels like we don't know how to achieve that feeling without the right foods. The good news is by having a clear and compelling life outcome and doing the right actions for your body fat stage, you'll find that your cravings have already slashed to a fraction of what they tend to be. And if you do have cravings, expand the time between feeling it and eating your craved food. Speed bumps like drinking a glass of water before going for the craved food or saying out loud, I'm about to eat food out of cravings before doing it reduces eating out of cravings. The goal isn't to eat out of cravings zero times. It's to eat at least twice more out of hunger than cravings while meeting your nutrition target. A big trigger for cravings can be self-sabotaging thoughts. There are three main buckets of this. The first is justification. This includes moral licensing like, I've been so good, I deserve some ice cream. Another is avoiding discomfort by doing fat loss habits you find easier, like eating whole foods or exercising while ignoring the actual habit that will cause fat loss, meeting your calorie target. Which leads to the dangerous belief of, I eat so healthy, or I'm doing so much, and yet don't lose weight. My body must be broken. When the real reason is you're just not doing the needful. And the last happens during procrastination or times of boredom, where you say, eating is important to fuel myself for this big project, so you go eat food as a way to delay facing the discomfort of starting on the big project. The second bucket is lacking self-esteem. It includes not feeling like you deserve to lose weight with thoughts like, I'm getting what I deserve. It's too hard. What's the point? Another is fear of failure where thoughts like, what if I don't succeed? Make you not fully commit to the plan, so you have to do the actions, which of course causes failure and reconfirms the belief that you were going to fail anyway. Fear of failure can go hand in hand with fear of judgment, like my friends will roll their eyes when they hear of my yet another weight loss attempt, or what if I'm not fun anymore? And the last bucket is identity loss. Here, staying overweight is a positive thing. This could be because of safety, where you fear the attention you'll get from losing weight. Another is if you have family or friends who are similarly overweight and your size is part of what makes you fit in. And lastly, you may fear losing the ability to point to being overweight as the reason undesirable events happen to you. Like, I don't go on dates because I'm overweight, or I didn't get that promotion because I'm overweight. When these thoughts reach their peak, you will find cravings to be unstoppable, binge, and then fall off the wagon for months and keep repeating the cycle, wondering what you're doing wrong. Tracking in your check-ins which bucket and specific self-sabotage script you're falling prey to will slash these instances by half or more. And then you'll need to play devil's advocate to your thought pattern. For example, if you have a belief like, I've been so good, I deserve ice cream, then the counter question would be, how does eating ice cream not serve me? Take a minute to record a voice note on your phone with your answer and then go for the craving if you still want to. Do this consistently and you'll find it all boils down to three to five scripts that run in your head automatically. You'll start thinking, ah, another one of those is happening, which will start detaching rational you from irrational you and make reprogramming your actions easier. But what about when you lose motivation? Is that self-sabotage? If you're like me, you've thought it is. I hired a personal trainer, coach, and even recruited a friend at different times to hold me accountable. Yet after a big brunch or during high work stress weeks, I'd fall off anyway and my accountability buddies would start feeling more irritating than motivating. I even signed up for an accountability site where my money goes to a charity I don't believe in if I don't do my habits. And after the first time it happened, I stopped using the site altogether. My mistake wasn't thinking external accountability and internal accountability, or what we call motivation, have the same natural pattern. Forcing my motivation to match external accountability is understandable, but unnatural. Instead, I need to work with the natural ebbs and flows of my motivation. I do check-ins, score your motivation, and when it's getting low, upfront opt for the low ramp or off ramp plan until your motivation score comes back up. All of this is a lot to keep in check and doing all of it at once violates principle one. So how do you know what is the 20% to work on that will produce 80% of your results? Actually, the first question is, do you even have a problem? As your history probably shows, even when you haven't had all of these 100% aligned, you have made progress. Our bodies don't need perfection. They need just enough of the actions and reactions to be right to lose fat. And you'll be surprised how few the just enough is. Here's the benchmark. If you're losing 0.5 to 1% body weight per week on average over two weeks, or if you're losing one to 3% body fat per month on average, 
over two months while losing more fat overall than lean mass, keep doing exactly what you're doing. Heads up on two things. One, these are the three main patterns of weight loss we have seen across our 700 plus clients. Don't be alarmed at these points, ride it out. This is why all benchmarks are on average, not every week or month. And you have the body fat benchmark to double check if you're truly stuck. Two, heads up that you're going to feel like you should be doing more. Here's a post from one of our clients saying this, other clients replying that they felt exactly the same, but also that it works. Resist the urge to fix things that aren't broken. But what about situations when you're not meeting benchmarks? To diagnose what to do, the best approach is a systems thinking methodology called theory of constraints. We identify the most important limiting factor standing in the way of progress, and then systematically improve that constraint until it no longer stands in the way. In contrast, most weight loss plans will not even look into your reactions, meaning at least a third of your factors are ignored. Then for factors they do look at, they will have you nail three times a week workouts, eat to a T to a meal plan or macro, and reduce junk and sweets drastically. But maybe your barrier is not even your actions, but your reactions. Or if your actions were the problem, cranking it to the max it asks for perfection, which is impossible to sustain for a month, let alone the rest of your life. Instead, what you want to do is first identify your most important limiting factor or bottleneck. Start with your actions and see if you met all of your targets. If not, then look into your reactions to diagnose which of them is the number one culprit for your not meeting the actions. Watch the part of the video that's about that reaction and settle on one thing to try for the next week to mitigate it. And a week later, do this process again. Or if you did meet the actions but still didn't see the right outcomes, watch the action section of this video again and decide on one action to change for next week only. Then a week later, do this process again. I'll be upfront, it will take many experiments to unblock yourself because the list of problems can be lengthy. There are eight different body outcomes possible, your life outcome statement may not be compelling enough, meaning you keep falling off despite making progress. Correlating body outcomes with just how much to adjust your calorie, protein, and workouts takes many iterations. And of course, navigating your reactions, especially mind reactions, can be a peeling and onion exercise where each progress reveals more and more blocks to tackle. You have two options. One, if you want me to help you shortcut through all the trial and error so you can get to your goal body and life quicker with peace and ease, then watch the five minute sneak peek into my Badass Body Boss program in the description and comments below to gauge fit. This program has worked for moms with kids and no time, busy professionals constantly interrupted by work, people with unstoppable cravings, people who fall off the wagon on weekends, people who couldn't stick to weight loss before us. It's worked for people with menopause, PCOS, thyroid problems. People have gone into remission from type two diabetes. People have lost weight so they could get pregnant. If you're sick and tired of weight loss consuming your thoughts and life and want to put it behind you once and for all, check out the five minute sneak peek into my Badass Body Boss program below. Or two, if you want to DIY it, then you don't want to ignore this video where I show the five atomic habits that made sticking to my nutrition plan 10 times easier. I lost 20 pounds and 11% body fat in a year, and I've kept it off for the past nine years. So you don't want to miss the complete step-by-step -step breakdown here. And always remember, you can do it.